This and the next two uh, lectures from, obviously you can see from the title, form a kind of threesome. Um, and um, I th I'm not sure whether they are in, in the nature of, of kind of career guidance or anecdotes or whether they, certainly this particular one, I mean, uh, being the oldest person probably in the room, uh, I probably qualify more to discuss the, the second lecture called How to Be an Old Architect. Um, but I can still remember how I was as a young architect. Um, whether either category uh, enables you to be an interesting architect will be the interesting question. And I, I, certainly from the point of view of preparing the lectures, uh, that's the hardest one to do because what defines interesting to one person might be grossly uninteresting to another person. Uh, and therefore, you will have to take it as being my own set of criteria. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I haven't, I haven't started the third one. I've started the second one because I'm going to be very busy between now and next Wednesday, and so I've got to get ahead of the, the game. And um, as I say, today, the question of how to be a young architect, I can see that most, there's probably almost no, no well, maybe one or two non-students here uh, who've already started to burn their boats. But there are, there are many factors uh, involved in, in, in this business of how to survive as an architect. Sometimes one, one wonders why people bother to do it at all. You certainly won't become rich, uh, or it's unlikely. Uh, there are quicker and easier ways even in bad times, of becoming rich. And um, it, it seems very curious to me that so many people who do architecture are not as interested in architecture as I would have expected them to be. Of course, it doesn't include you. It must be true of you. Statistically, probably includes some of you. You sort of s rub your eyes in the morning and think, why, 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 why am I doing this? Uh, you know, maybe some of you because mummy or daddy were architects. Uh, maybe be some, some of you because you were good at maths and art at school. So somebody said, ah, architect. And others, um, you know, for very curious reasons, you wanted really to be a painter, but the family didn't think that was a very... I mean, I, I know many people who come within these particular categories. Uh, wanted to be a painter, but the family said, no, no, that's a dodgy thing to be, <laughs> so why not be an architect, which is also a dodgy thing to be. <laughs> anyway, um, the other thing is, of course, the perspective from which I speak is I, I, I still don't, though statistically I'm an old architect, I don't like to think of myself as an old architect, and I constantly go around looking up uh, the names of people who are active and older than me, of whom there are still a few. In fact, there are quite a few. Uh, and, and that will be the basis of, 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 of what I talk about next week. But now to this, this week. To what extent is it to do with personality? To what extent is it, is it to do with circumstance? To what extent is it to do with timing and location? And I think a lot to do with both of those. About five days ago, I was in Denmark. And I was brought in to be a diploma examiner of this young man. I'd never met him before. He's in the School of Architecture of Aarhus, which is in Denmark. It's a big architecture school. Um, not a fantastically interesting architecture school. Occasionally it's produced somebody rather good. And occasionally it's had somebody rather interesting teaching there. But it's a, it's a general purpose, shall we say, They'd hate me to say, a general purpose European architecture school somewhere in Europe that probably most of you will never go to. And there's a young man. Uh, and what's interesting about this photo is that it covers, he is a, a serious, rather tall and serious, very Danish. Uh, and on the film, the, the right-hand side, he's showing a film, which I've not seen it done before, of how he draws how he produces stuff, he somehow documented himself drawing and making things over a week. 
And to him, it was rather important that he communicated his process. And I thought that was very intelligent and rather interesting. Uh, his project, you can just see a, piece, a model of it in front. He did produce, by Scandinavian standards, quite a lot of work. Uh, think about that. <laughs> and um, he was dedicated to his work. He made an, a, a project for the turning of a castle into a museum and working place for uh, a Danish artist. And uh, he'd researched it well, and he drew a lot. And it was interesting that in a school where even there, not just you, it, the whole place is virtually digital, he was like a throwback. He had done pencil drawings and lots of physical models. Um, and um, this was it. So there he is already saying that what he really wants to do is to work making small buildings and keep his connections with the art world. He's already, therefore, choosing an awkward territory. Denmark has a lot of architects. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in, in connecting with the art world uh, you sort of and, and don't want to do anything to do with commercial buildings or public buildings, you reduce the, you reduce the options, and so on and so forth. And I thought that was a good place to start. What the hell to do? What will happen to this young architect? Does he know how to be, or hasn't he given it a thought? About uh, just under a year ago, um, I set a competition because I was curating the Cyprus, of all things, the Cyprus exhibit at the Venice Biennale, and I persuaded the Cypriot government to put a little bit of money for a, uh, a competition for presumably young architects. It didn't say young architects, but one knew that they would be the sort of people who go in for it. A competition of ideas about recreation, uh, which links to the, uh, the Cyprus, which is basically a recreational island, and relax. And I got about 150 entries. And Odile Deck came over, and with a couple of local guys, we, we, we juried the project. These were two of the slightly more successful projects. They didn't win. And they show the sort of thing that, that um, maybe looking at the jury, the entries thought, ah, we'll do some stuff which is sort of overtones of technology. The, the, the left-hand one was quite witty um, and actually done by a couple of Italians. I can't remember who did the right-hand one, but there were lots and lots and lots, of, and you sit for a day or more looking at endless, quite well-produced panels. I don't think that, I, I think there was out of 150, very, very few that were embarrassingly bad, partly because of the use of the computer, partly because everybody now can do Photoshop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that um, there's no excuse for a tacky-looking panel. That is a very interesting development that has occurred, I think, for somebody of my age, over the last 20 years, that, that more than 20 years ago, you, people gave you a photograph of something and a bit of a drawing and a bit of this and a bit of that and, and hoped that you got the idea. Now, because the process that one has on the, on the computer is so organized, it is quite difficult to produce an unreadable drawing. It's quite dif difficult to produce uh, an, un an unclean-looking photographic piece of material. It's just possible if you really try. It also almost becomes then an art piece. And so you're looking at a lot of stuff which has a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence. And I think that that raises, uh, in my mind, the issue of, of does that make it quicker to see whether the thing has got any ideas? Or does it present a kind of smoke screen by which a lot of the ideas in such presentations are actually derived from the raw material from which the Photoshop was taken? In other words, it's very often somebody else's ideas. Um, and of course, it then raises the issue as to whether somebody has ideas is inherently better 
than somebody who doesn't have ideas. I'm old-fashioned enough to think, yes, they are. But the pulling the wool over your eyes has become a, a refined business. It so happened that this guy won the competition. And when we opened the envelopes, he came from an unpronounceable named place. And, and, and we being either, in fact, two of us English, one French and one Cypriot, we, we were saying, where the hell is that? And then it was, it was Russia. And the name was so obscure, that we assumed you see, in our sort of Eurocentric way, we assumed it was somewhere past the Urals. Once we Googled up the name of the place, we found it was actually, in, in fact, it's a, a beautiful and historic, rather posh, small town, very close to St. Petersburg. Uh, that it wasn't obscure, it was actually <laughs> relatively me metropolitan. And when the guy himself showed up at the Biennale, he was an extremely sophisticated young man with an extremely beautiful and sophisticated sister who had to do all the translating because he didn't speak English, but you bet he will be in about a year's time. And he was networking like crazy across, across the Biennale. And that was interesting because somebody with whom you could not, it's a very rare case these days, somebody with whom you could not communicate in English, but nonetheless had all the apparatus. And he was only 21 years old. Aha! Uh, and he was still, I guess, a third year or fourth year student at the St. Petersburg Academy. But he had his name card and his website, and he was networking with the beautiful sister to assist him, which wasn't good, which was rather a good ploy, actually. Everybody made a beeline to the sister and then said, oh, there's this bright guy who seems to be her brother, presumably brother and sister. What I'm describing... Is, is again an interesting phenomenon that maybe, and, and, the, and the, why did he win, you may ask? Because the pro we all found the project refreshingly simple and kind of slightly haunting. It didn't use a lot of techniques, though the techniques that it used seemed, he seemed to be very assured with. It was a, a, a clear, slightly strange, idea, and it stood out from the rest. It was amazing. We had no difficulty in choosing this as the first prize. It just had a freshness that the rest of all the clever tricks and the layers and the this and the uh, didn't have. I found the other morning that I had a catalogue for a competition. I don't really know much about it. It was organized in Spain. But the competition is clearly the, the, the traditional method by which you try and rise above the rest, so to speak. Um, I can remember already as a second year student, before I came to the A, I was studying in a place called Bournemouth, and I read about some of the sort of bright young things or the bright older things in England at the time in a copy of the Architectural Review. And it seemed to be that everybody listed, there are about 40 or 50 people, analyzed, that they had all won competitions or got prizes in competitions, and they all seemed to be doing a bit of teaching. So there I was, sitting in Bournemouth, age still only 17, thinking, ha, ah, that's what you do. Do competitions, do teaching. And I said, that, that stayed rather simplistically in my mind, is what you did if you wanted to sort of rise out of the masses. And, and indeed, that's what I did except that the teaching rather <laughs> took over. Uh, and the competitions, uh, you win a few and you lose, you lose a lot. Um, and winning them does not necessarily mean that you build them, as I had discovered that out of seven wins, I built one and maybe we'll get the second one built. But uh, it doesn't, the one is not necessarily the consequence of the other. Competitions like this are, seem to have become increasingly popular which are competitions where there is absolutely no stated in intention of building. They are euphemistically called ideas competitions. They are well published. They are elegantly published. And they are, as you can see from the, 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 the people who entered, very international, uh, entered by people who know that there's no likelihood of what you do being built. But you might gain a few brownie points that will advance you in, in front of your fellows. 
And um, so this particular house competition was won by somebody from the École Spéciale d'Architecture, which I happen to know because I, I go there every two weeks. Um, I, I don't think it's the best architecture school in the world, um, but it's, it has a few bright people. I don't know who this particular student is. Uh, anyhow, it just so happened that it won it. The competition was organized in Spain. It produces a very elegant catalog, very clear, very easy to follow. I could, have, I could have bored you all for the next half hour with sort of almost every page from that catalog. That's not the purpose of me showing it. I don't particularly know whether the, the, the first prize winner is that much better than the rest. It's, it's, it's okay. A um, bit, bit thin on the ground by my uh, taste or, or expectancy. And so one could take another entry coming from the Technical University of Berlin, which is definitely not the best architecture school in the world. Uh, I, my experience of the TU in Berlin is that many people like to go there because it's in Berlin but they, a lot of them produce crap. But this, this is uh, in, in the great vegetation tradition, which I'm very familiar with, and not bad. It's a bit of a rip-off of some guys in Stuttgart, but there you go. And, you know, here's a um, Singhus University, wherever that might be, China. It says it's in China. Um, rather banal, uh, but amusing nonetheless. And I think it's, a, you know, one can go through these things and say, well, perhaps it's, it's best of breed. Perhaps the jury sitting there in Spain, wondering what the hell all this stuff is, says, we'll have one of those vegetation ones. We'll have one that sort of folds a few things out, one that sticks itself in the side of a hillside, and one because it's drawn. I mean, you do sit there in these juries, and you almost do what in, in England. We have a, a wonderful institution, which is called Cruft Dog Show. Uh, in which the dogs uh, compete day by day for the best gun dog, the best mountain dog, the best, uh, I don't know, small dog, etc., etc. And there are many categories of dog, as you well know. And then finally, on the final day, the 20 best of breed dogs compete for dog of the, <laughs> for dog of the year. And this year it might be a mountain dog, next year it might be a poodle, you don't know. Uh, and so the, the judges probably have a very difficult time comparing unlike with unlike. And I think many of these sorts of architectural competitions are done somewhat like that. So that if you, if you have a group of people who all do the same kind of thing, let's say hypothetically there's some school in, 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 in the north of Germany where everybody does you know, social housing with a wobbly top, then in a curious way the medium good people will be eliminated because everybody's doing social housing with a wobbly top. And if you're a, a, an intelligent jury, you'll be able to suss out which is the best one and which is the second best one and which is the interesting one. And then the rest fall by the wayside. Whereas if, if there's some buffoon who's doing, I don't know, a triangular mushroom, uh, you'll say, wow, that's a bit interesting. Triangular mushrooms, maybe... Maybe, 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 maybe. At least you'll have a conversation about it. Now, what am I suggesting? What am I suggesting that, that is, the is the proficiency the issue? Is the satisfying of the brief the issue? Is, or is originality the issue? Or is there a boredom factor that the generation ahead of you, but that are well-informed, the, people, the sorts of people who sit on juries, will either be extremely partisan, they will love what you do because you do what they do or what they like you to do. But if they're not partisan, if they're made up of a mixture of people, if they're still intelligent, uh, they will be already bored by what everybody is doing. And I think that's why for us particular group sitting there in Cyprus, you know, this French lady, this Eng two English guys, and so we... We were bored by most of the stuff. It's the same stuff. A gadget here, a bit of morphing there, a bit of Photoshop. Oh, God. <sighs> Aha! What's this? It's calm and it's cool. And it's, there's a 
there's sort of poetics about it. At least it's different. <laughs> now, I'm not, I don't know the, the, who was on this particular jury. Um, it looks, if you look through the catalogue, as they had a, a, a Crufts dog show approach to the matter. Okay, I move on from this issue of the competition then as, as a sort of possible way out to a different route, a completely different route. Many, many, many years ago, when I was teaching here, before it was a unit system, I was in charge of the fifth year, the year system. And we were billeted out across the other side of the square in the basement. And I had my office as fifth year master, and there was a studio behind, going down through the basement. And in the corridor was a, was a phone booth. In the days when you had a phone booth with a sort of press box and you put coins in the top, this phone booth was in tremendous activity. As in fact, it says, tells you why. Because there was a group of guys, uh, the most famous of whom is called Piers Goff, uh, and they are CZWG, their office now is Campbell, Zagolovich, Wilkinson, and Goff. And Roger Zagolovich actually left the firm many years ago, but it still carries his name. And they, st they were running an office from the, st from the studio. And when they were in the corridor at the, at, the, at, at the phone booth, they were ringing their quantity surveyor most of the time. There were long conversations about saving money on roofing tiles or, or you know, concrete screeds. And so. I mean, you could hear it. I mean, we all knew it was, in fact, one encouraged it. It seemed great that there were three guys there uh, running, running an office. And uh, there were a number of other people in that particular year, actually, who have sub subsequently become quite famous, uh, including a lady called Janet Street Porter, who is now a sort of television, pro the lady with the funny voice on the television. But I digress. This particular group of people, there they are, cartoons, um, were part of a definitively different group than anybody who'd come before. They were the first well-dressed mods. If you look back into English cultural history, you'll find there was a period called where there was a battle between what were called the mods and the rockers. And these were, were AA mods. And they were very articulate, particularly peers, larger than life. Uh, peers, the articulate one, Rex, the design talent, uh, Zagolovich, the presenter, and Campbell, the money man. And they are still, they are still that. And they went on, they built Litwit Shop almost um, very quickly. Uh, and it was pulled down. There was one, one shop they did in South Moulton Street called Mary Farin, which I think lasted for three months. It still exists on photographs. But you had to be quick to catch some of their stuff because they were in the height of the sort of, you know, uh, 60s boutique, the end of the 60s boutique scene. And these things would appear. Some say, see, the Goff and Co. had just done something down the road. You'd rush down there with a the camera because you knew it's being pulled down the next day. But they hung on in and they built and um, well, they st are still in existence. Now the second generation are taking over the firm. And as things move, the buildings have become less definitive. But they had a tremendous, whether it is to your taste is not really the issue. They had a, an immense sense of style. Everything from the sorts of shirts that they wore to the sort of graphics, the color, the mannerisms. You would know that they were there at a party if they were there. And they built some pretty big buildings, mostly uh, down in Docklands. Uh, and it's, this sort of building has certain connotations with, with uh, 20th century progressive architecture in France and elsewhere, uh, but has that sort of English, slightly fussy take upon it. Uh, but is certainly a large and serious building. So they, they, they graduated from boutique through to doing proper buildings. And there are whole pieces of, of southeast London, which are particularly around the Design Museum area, which are, which are designed like them, these sort of pieces with blue tiles and statues in the middle and so on. They're sort of, sort of pomo, but they, they, they're not, it's 
that is just simply a description of their manners. The point I'm making is, not that, but that they started being an office while still in school and, ha and made a point of it. And it became, around that time, expected that, why not? Why not? You don't have to have a diploma to start an office. You might get the diploma after, after you start started the office. What fascinates me, I have, like all of us, I get, I get plied with innumerable business cards, name cards. And what fascinates me is what, what people like to present themselves as on their name card. So you get some people who put drawings of their work. Uh, as long as <laughs> the one on the top right there, I seem to have obscured what they're called. Maybe they've got a name on the back. And so you have this thing, you think, ah, funny drawing, I wonder who did that? Uh, and then there are others that, 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 for example, the one nearly at the top of the top left, the one with the sort of photograph on it. Um, I guess they have made the decision that they don't want regular clients, uh, but they do interesting stuff, because it looks very much like a student project. Uh, whether it is for a, something that is a sort of egg mixer, or something that might stick out to see, it, it's a bit ambiguous. But they have made the decision, or maybe it's not a decision, maybe that's the only thing they've ever done, but there is their thing. They give it to you, you say, hey, that's interesting. But you're probably not going to commission them to do anything. You just want to phone them up and have a good time. Then there are one, there's a whole thing about the naming of the office. I have an office called Crab, so I can't really talk about it, except Crab represents the names of the people. But look at, look at, look at who we have there. Power and fish. Um, and there's some more on the next page. Uh, and, and people who just put the hard information about themselves or a picture or who are caught like Mariko Yamashita, who is caught as merely one of, I think it's five, or there were 5,000 architects in, in the Nikensike office. And so that in a sense her mandate is purely to say, I am there, this is where you can phone me. But nothing, you know, if you phone her, you're not going to get Nikensike to jump up and down. Lovely lady though she happens to be. Or you get interesting ones where there is the couple. Mark Dytham and Astrid Klein, he English, I think, she German, met at the Royal College of Art and for reasons I don't know, ended up in Japan, have ended up as rather successful and highly known. Uh, and they still have these, the yellow card for Astrid, the yellow card for Mark. Or we haven't, <laughs> you notice, there's me writing on the card below. Husband, wife. Just because I wouldn't know that what the rest that were, well, from where I sit, Rika or Ishii might be a man or might be a lady. Uh, I'm not that good at Japanese, but I remind my... And then what's interesting, though, the husband uh, describes himself on the English side of the card. This is the sort of spady English side of the card. As integral. And the wife describes herself as visionary. That's interesting. Now, that's very interesting. So, hello, here I am. I'm integral. <laughs> ah, no, maybe I am a visionary. And then you go away thinking, you sort of think about it. That's quite, it's quite provocative. And then you get somebody who's a very good architect around town here, Peter Barber. Peter Barber architect. Well, at the time he did this card, I think it was just him. He does now have a proper office with several people. But... The, the, it's interesting in England, you say, you're so-and-so architect, even if it's you in a Sainsbury's carrier bag. I always find that intriguing, the, the notion that you're only treated seriously if you are, so to speak, corporate. Or, of course, you have somebody like Abelos and Herreros with an extremely dull-looking card, but you know and I know that they're one of the most interesting and successful firms of architects in Europe. Uh, and then people with uh, strange names again. Space menu, cell space, as well as visionary and integral. So this notion of what you call yourself is 
very intriguing. And the card, you know, I know because I had to do it myself. You spend a lot of time deciding what should go on that card. People, people go into paroxysms of detail. They sort of say, well, I'm not sure. You know, should I put that? Should we, should we say that we're this? Should we say architects and planners? Should we? And you have a debate among them, lasting a week. You know, should you use uppercase or lowercase? And, you know, we decided to put a drawing on our card uh, because it was Gavin's drawing. It's such, such a nice drawing. But then, should we use that color or this color? And 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 yet, when push comes to shove, you know, does it matter? And I, I alluded, of course, to the business of Nikon Sike because it is, I think, the largest architect's office in the world. And this was a project that we were judging in Barcelona recently for one of those awards. And it's done by a young, very keen young architect, one of the 5,000 working in Nikon Sike. And I happened to see the building after we'd done the awarding, and I hadn't awarded it anything. But it's, it's, it's an interesting psychology that the big office will encourage bright talent. But still, when you analyze the building, it looks sort of interesting on the outside. When you analyze the building, it's a very straightforward piece of floor upon floor upon floor upon floor with the cinema part tucked in somewhere where it's not too expensive to put it. And you can't help feeling that somebody with that degree of uh, sculptural dexterity, which is reasonable, uh, left to his or her own devices, might have done a more interesting scheme. But basically, it was a commercial scheme with a bit of interesting clothing over it. Now, that's me sort of post-rationalizing. Uh, you realize when you, were, when you were judging the project that it wasn't as interesting as it at first looked like. And then as soon as you knew that it had come from an enormous commercial operation, you say, well, of course, you know. Uh, you could imagine all the pressures upon the guy to get it even that far. Now, this is me being cynical after the event. But, um, you know, I was just reminded of that by looking at the card of one of his colleagues with Nick and Sike in it. Here's another phenomenon. A um, couple of guys in Norway got a grant from the Norwegian government and bought a caravan and, and went up to a place called Bodo, which is way up in Norway, and moved the caravan around a series of small towns up in the relatively darker part of Norway and had this as, as sort of advisors. They went around and they had landed uh, the odd job up there now. They're doing an art center, for example. But they were only third-year students. Somehow or other, the Norwegian government is very supportive of such enterprises. And fantastic Norway and its caravan then was invited to go elsewhere. And this last summer, after being on the road for about two or three years, it ended up in the Venice Biennale. And here we see fantastic Norway advertising its wares, having, having people making... Um, cakes and so on, Norwegian cakes, whatever they were, in the middle of, in the prime position, in the middle of the Venice Biennale. These guys have now graduated. And fantastic Norway is, in fact, an office. The work it does looks at social issues, looks at bits of this and that, is very much applied to uh, the problems of, of the terrain. But now, what's the latest with Fantastic Norway? Having made quite a splash for themselves and starting to appear in, in smart books and so on, and biennales, and getting bits of jobs, they have moved into Oslo. They have moved into a warehouse area, somewhat like Clerkenwell would be here. Uh, they share their offices with a fashion designer on the same floor, and, uh, and uh, I don't know, graphic designers on the floor below. It is <laughs> they have entered the world which we know. And they have name cards, and they have telephones, and they have desks, and they have interns. And, and <laughs> there's, there's the caravan. 
in the yard. It's not quite in the dump, but <laughs> I'm not sure it would ever go on the road again. And in a sense, there's a, a certain symbolism to this. There was this amazing original idea of the Norwegian government breathing money into it. And that lasted it for a while. But it is very cold and dark up there. And you can do the working drawings in Oslo and fly up as necessary. You know, and there are better coffee shops in Oslo than in Bodø, etc., etc. There is the phenomenon of the young architects who make a, a very special contribution to the discussion of architecture. And I think Atelier Bauer, largely through their publications, which are extremely witty, they also teach, of course, and, and, and get their students to, to, to do the, much of the research for them and many of the diagrams. And they, they have become classics of their kind. It's interesting to compare the operation with the actual architecture. I think it, the, the Atelier Bauer couple are good. I don't think they're that special. You know, if you look at the cross-section to it, yes, it, which is their own house and studio, uh, it's okay, uh, but it's, it's okay. And they produce lots and lots of stuff, and I think they're most, ex but, but it's sort of, I'm not sure that you would cross the street to know about it if it were for not for the way in which they produce these amazing books. The most amazing, which I've got a rather bad download of, is, is the book called Pet Architecture, from which their theory or their analysis of Japanese architecture, where the little pet building is attached to the main building, and they're very and they're very cool, very very uh, intelligent about the way in which they describe ideas. So they are architects who come up through being articulate, clear, graphic, and interesting. So almost <laughs> could jump into my last category. Whether they are the best designers in Tokyo, I don't think they're the worst designers but I don't think their designs are as interesting as they are. This, of course, might go for a lot. And if they continue to be successful, I could very cynically say it won't matter because they can always hire good designers if they are intelligent and interesting themselves. Staying in Japan for a moment, I was just before Christmas, I had this task of being the curator for a thing called New Trends. And my fellow crea uh, curator was Toyo Ito. He had to choose seven Asian architects, and I had to choose seven European architects. And we then presented them. And here are the, uh, mostly the Europeans, a couple of Asians, uh, lined up like some kind of fashion parade, uh, presenting their wares. And here is a, 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 a couple on the left. He uh, is an Austrian, she is a Norwegian. They call themselves Helen and Hard, and they operate out of Stavanger. The next lady along is, is, is Askun Chinchilla, who is from Madrid, and the lady on the right is um, Isabel Eru of the uh, French office, Eru and Arno. Uh, and here they are with Mr. Ito, enjoying a look at the camera. And of course, the, the work presented varied from the inventive to the particular. This is uh, Ero and Arno's work. They do a lot of music installations at the moment. They're doing concert halls and concert installations, uh, some warehouses and offices. They, and they operate out of Grenoble which is not the center of the French architecture world. We had them two nights ago up the road at Store Street talking about that. Or you have Helen and Hard, who do some very inventive stuff um, in and around Stavanger. A lot of it to do with using uh, components brought from the oil industry, the North Sea oil industry. Imaginative. Interestingly, he is an Austrian and connects in with a very vital theme which you get in, in Vienna. But they met when in the architecture school at Oslo. 
or Ero and Anna again building things into the rock. Very good strategists, very good building strategies. Or you get a guy who comes from a funny place, from an island. Bernardo Rodriguez actually comes from the Azores, which is not a, the sort of, again, not the center of the architecture world. Has done lots of projects for the Azores, though he has moved his body, so to speak, to a Porto. Maybe for various personal reasons. Maybe he got bored in the Azores. Maybe he gets a better deal building for the Azores so long as he's not there. I'm, I'm again being slightly cynical. There are lots of layers of reasoning where you position yourself. It, it, I, I'm sure it's much more fun to be in a Porto, which I think is a rather good city, than to be in whatever is the capital of the Azores. But his operational center is still the Azores, and he's He's building a lot, a lot of stuff, and then beginning to get weird projects. Maybe they won't be built way outside the Portuguese scene altogether. Or you get Adam Sonlay Fischer, a Hungarian who was trained in Sweden by a combination of a, a couple who used to be in London, uh, a Uruguayan lady and an Australian partner, and were, in, in fact, is he is part of a, in what I call international electronic weird ship network. In other words, he connects through to the world of John Fraser, who sometimes features here, the whole cybernetic world, and, and Unit 14 up at the Bartlett, which is a sort of international network of electronic, robotic, cyber freak people. He happens to be Hungarian, but actually he's part of that international network. And I, I got to know him through the Biennale before last, where suddenly the Hungarian pavilion was full of very strange plastic penguins that, of Chinese origin, which were little tiny robots. And he has done some brilliant stuff in this field. He, he is not designing buildings, but he is one of the now much talked about robotics people. He is a young architect. Again, I, I wanted uh, young architects who would have something different to say. Or Chinchilla, who is very, very exotic and, and erudite person. Uh, with a social conscience and a very good way with invention. Strange material. Or another guy that was presented by Ito Ito, uh, I can't pronounce his name, but Mr. Saria, uh, who had done projects to do with temples. He'd done some insertions into seminaries and temples. Uh, and his stuff was very, again, refreshingly different from the rest. Or a young Korean who, having gone to Colombia to do his postgraduate, came back and was done a plethora of buildings, uh, as somebody described the other night, of, of many different mannerisms, but moving fast, moving very fast. And one of the buildings actually saw and photographed before I knew whose it was. I simply thought it was a very, very intelligent use of downtown Seoul uh, and is basically a ramp with small shops that move their way up the ramp within a kind of ecological sort of garden at the top in an enclosure. Highly intelligent, very immediate. So these are people who, who I think such events are useful for saying, here's, I was doing a bit in, in my own selection of my seven people, I was also doing a sort of cross dog show thing. I wanted one digital person, one person from a funny place, one person that I didn't personally know, another person who I kept hearing about from students, another person who I know is just on the cusp of really interesting things. Plus somebody I knew very well who's lectured to you 
uh, if you know C.J. Lim, who was the, the, the London representative, it, it intrigued me because he is, in fact, an Asian who has spent most of his life in, in England. So there is this cross crossbreed thing. Or there is the predicament facing the highly intelligent young architect. The predicament of the academy. And here we are sitting in an academy. And here I am with somebody who spent most of my uh, life in academy. I say academy quite deliberately rather than school or university. Academy and all that academic means. And if you hold three professorships, you can be allowed to be <laughs> rude about the system. I think that what intrigues me about this man is that he is one of the most totally architectural people I, I have had the pleasure to meet. And I mean that from a point of view that he is knowledgeable, talented, graphic, articulate, and everything, and can, can, can operate in at least three major languages extremely fluently. He has four languages. Extremely fluent. He's Portuguese, half Portuguese, half German. But fluent German, fluent English, fluent Spanish, as well as presumably <laughs> fluent Portuguese, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he must now be about 34, I think. I'm not absolutely certain. This is one of the projects that he did when he was a master's student. He was very interested in skins. And he did drawings of skins. But he could also draw all of the works of Le Corbusier almost from memory. Uh, and he and his, his uh, associate, Marion Coletti, have done a lot of things. This is just one page documenting some of the exhibitions they've taken part in. Lots of biennales, lots of galleries, lots of things here and there and then, always lots of stuff that they produce. But what is interesting, as they've moved on, they made the decision to, add, were already teaching, had already got all their distinctions and postgraduate masters and blah, 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 blah. And then started doing a PhD, each of them doing a PhD. The PhD has taken something like six years, possibly nearly seven. They both now have their doctorates. In the and, and in fact, these pages are taken from Marcos Cruz's doctoral thesis. Uh, a lot of a lot of projects, a lot of drawings, a lot of ideas, a lot of things, a lot of stuff, a lot of interesting contrivances, and on and on. And here we go. My God, it's page 526. Um, page by 526, Marcos Cruz is still justifying his activities by doing a sort of imitation of a Charles Jenks diagram. Now, I think there's some people who are sort of have narrow enough minds or, or thoughtless enough minds that what the hell can they do? They do a Charles Jenks type diagram because it looks sort of clever. But this guy doesn't need that. He produces amazing stuff. He, he's a brilliant teacher. He's, he does wonderful drawings and schemes and skins and projects and temporary buildings and you name it. What's he doing, fucking around doing a Charles Jenks diagram so that it goes to page 526? My view, and I have very strong views about this, is that there's a certain point at which it becomes either a, a piece of, of academic security measure, knowing that in many countries of the world, unless you have a, a doctorate, you will never be made a professor. And there are more and more and more and more countries, from Australia through Greece to God knows where, Scandinavia, etc., where unless you have a professorship, you can only get so far as a teacher. And many of us know that some of the best and most interesting stuff is done in school. And therefore, if you cut yourself out 
of, of teaching. You cut yourself away from a very major piece of, of architectural culture. On the other hand, here's a guy who, you know, at the age of 28 was doing amazing stuff, 29, 30. By 32, 33, he slowed down. Okay, he's got his doctorate now. This particular doctoral thesis actually was recently awarded the medal as the best PhD thesis in the English language for the last six years. So you can say, okay, well, maybe fair enough. But my view is that he could have done a more, 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 more wonderful stuff. He slowed him down. Now, I'm sure there are people, maybe some sitting in the room, who would strongly disagree with me, who might say, well, but, you know, the cerebral is important to develop theories, is important, you know, to, 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 to stand aside from just producing lots of stuff is important. Yes, 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 but not to the extent of six to one. My worry is that this has become, an, and many of you will do, probably many of you sitting here are already doing your PhDs. And I'm not sure whether the payoff is that good to architecture. And some people who are still interested in making things and doing things and drawing things and building things will be put off by the daunting thought of the six years and will then be eliminated from having influence among students. I mention it rather vehemently as part of this diatribe on the, on the young architect because I think it is something that faces your generation, which just didn't face mine. I think I'm smart enough to have done a PhD if I'd thought of it. But it never crossed my mind. I was too busy doing interesting things. At, at the time, I was knocking around at PhD level. There, there was, you know, it was only a certain sort of person who did something like that. Some sort of crabby, bookish character, you know, who kind of hadn't got the wit to do a design which does not apply <laughs> to this guy. So it's an interesting phenomenon. I merely mention it. There are other institutions where I could probably say it more vehemently uh, because it doesn't necessarily apply to the age. But, of course, Marcos has edited an issue of AD, one of the best recent issues. So you can say his contribution to architecture is rolling along. But I want to see what he produces. I take a sort of slightly parallel person with slightly different history, about whom I know a little bit less. Um, a, a lady who uh, is probably about six years older than that now, um, uh, called Lindy Roy, who operates out of New York. She's a South African uh, from Cape Town University who did her postgraduate studies in, in Colombia, I think, and also spends an enormous amount of her time teaching. But she has an office and has recently done a 14-floor high building in New York. So that's positive. What's interesting is to see this quote from her website. It's just a little piece of it. She worked in about 18 offices in her first two years after graduating in the 1990 recession, the last one, guys. Uh, with an MArch degree from Columbia. It was just absolute hell. It was insane, says Roy. And that <laughs> could be you guys. Um, she managed to get a project, which I don't think has ever been built, but it was back in, in South Africa somewhere, for a, a resort. And that was the, the scheme that really got, got her known around the place. I was fascinated when she came to give a lecture at the Bartlett some time ago because she had that very Columbia habit of, of giving a lecture, which is about an hour and a quarter lecture, of which about 50 minutes, if not more, were establishing the theoretical credentials by which she worked. And I don't know what would have happened down in Bedford Square, but certainly up the street, that part of the lecture went like a lead balloon. People were saying, yeah, come on, Lindy. What do you actually do? But it was very interesting for me to analyze it. There would seem to be this, this intellectual presumption, or this presumption that you would not be taken seriously unless you'd given a whole lot of kind of philosophical and, and theoretical and crossing the T's and dotting the I's stuff. And then she came onto the stuff, and the stuff is very good. 
she's an extremely good designer. Very interesting designer, an interesting lady. But she'd lost, she'd lost the audience. That may, of course, be a cultural difference between the East Coast of the United States and the North End of Bloomsbury. I suspect it would have been also the same in the South End of Bloomsbury, but I might be wrong. Um, and so I thought it was interesting to juxtapose her example alongside Marcos Cruz. I think they're both amazingly good architects. I think they both find themselves in the London context or in the New York context under a certain kind of obligatory pressure. And because they're bright and because they can do all of these things, in a way they fall into the trap more. Because if, if they were not articulate, if they were not able to write, or if they were not able to draw, or if they were not able to make, they would be, it would be easier to, 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 to make a thing of one side or the other. Because they can do all these things, they come under a very interesting set of, and as will you if you're any good. The other day, though, in, in Denmark, round the corner from the school, in fact, one of the teachers at the school, was a different case. An Englishman who'd met a Danish girl at some convenient or inconvenient moment and had gone over to Denmark. Uh, she then ditched him. He's got a different Danish girl who, and several children uh, and is, is living in Aarhus. He was the best English student at the time. He won the, the RIBA silver medal in his moment uh, from East London. And his, his office is like a sort of throwback. We're not in the digital. We're not in the theoretical. We're in the woodsy. And he is an amazingly good designer, I think. His office, and it's an office, it's not a school studio. And quite a lot of these bits and pieces are being built. They're not just funny little old models. They're actually, particularly the things with the roofs on them, are, are either serious competition projects or in two of the cases on the wall, they're actually under construction or constructed. And it's a real throwback. It is an office. He has about four assistants, and he wins competitions from time to time. And he builds, and he experiments, and he makes things. There is <laughs> about one laptop, maybe two. So it's not completely in the dark ages. But uh, you can see the priority here, that the priority is actually making stuff and doing things. And stuff is the name that he's given his office. This particular project is under construction. There is a, a sports hall roof for a school, uh, and it's... It's, got, it's an interesting idea, rather like uh, imagination around the corner. It has a sort of Teflon or whatever uh, drape, but it has a double skin drape with props that go between the two so that the whole structure is actually maintained by, by stretching the two skins between. Uh, and then uh, it has a light quality when you're inside the shed so that the light is filtered by the second skin. I mentioned that in some detail because I think he's very good at this kind of thing. Here's another roof project for a building uh, also, I think, to be built. That's something... Is it circumstance? Did he choose to find his way into Denmark? Did he have a penchant for the Danish and the Danish lady? And the, his, his wife is, is, a, is a musician. And the house, one of the few people I know of his generation who is built, is a built in... <laughs> sorry, has built and lives in his own design house, which is full of musical instruments of different kinds, because that's her business. And so he has gone to a place that most of us wouldn't. I mean, frankly, Aarhus is not the most exciting town in Europe. But it's there, and it does stuff, and he does stuff, and things, and wood, and has an architectural tradition of a certain kind, and there are a few slightly interesting architects around town. It's worth thinking about. Worth thinking about. Do you, for various reasons, find somewhere for which, to which your temperament is suited? Uh, though it may not be the centre of the world, and you spend the whole time saying, yes, but we can get Ryanair to, to Stansted. You know, we're not completely cut off from the world. And 
to do some very, very, very elegant stuff. I don't know many people who graduated in his particular year who are doing as much as he is of, of the, that is actually the product of his own brain. Or you get somebody else in, in Korea who, another guy with a similar name to the other one, who moon was one, who does crazy stuff, because he, 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 he can do crazy stuff and does publications of crazy stuff. Uh, he can do more crazy stuff, 3D, it's a little bit imitative of, of um, Nat Chard's work, but there we go. Or he can do straight stuff. I don't know him personally. I just found him interesting as a phenomenon. He can do buildables, unbuildables. They're sort of jokey. Uh, presumably, he will end up doing, spending most of his time doing stuff that's even more buildable than this. Uh, am I being cynical? What motivates? What motivates people to do, to find a territory where they might be able to apply things, rather like the Hungarian, but here a little bit more so. Um, some people in Lyon are able to produce street installations, though it's questionable uh, who will give them whole buildings to do. And the territory of, of architects moving into to, to lighting, into surfaces, into advertising, into quasi-advertising, into packaging, into temporary enclosures, uh, is an interesting phenomenon, which may be a way out of the, the frustration. Or you might be lucky and exuberant and productive, as this guy in Spain, who, who clearly has a very fertile architectural mind and it leads even to doing you know quasi-modernist villas or light drape or lighter drape or shape I mean very exuberant architecture now here was one of my name cards what amuses me about Claudio Beckstein's name card is <laughs> there's a lot of words on it it's not particularly graphically interesting. It's full of telephone numbers. Claudio is absolutely desperate to keep in contact. He's got more, you know, he <laughs> there he is sitting most of the time in Arizona, desperate to keep in contact. And I met him first when he was postman in, um, in Lyon. Where he had gone as an Argentinian Jew of German origin, uh, in order to rediscover his, to, in order to rediscover his uh, origins, as it were, and fell under the spell of of uh, Enrique Marias, who by that time had, was running the department, uh, and of course, uh, and worked for him for a bit. What's intriguing is that he has actually built two rather good buildings in Buenos Aires, which, if you take the history of the last few years, is difficult enough. Somehow or other, he got to build two hospital buildings. And they're rather good. In fact, they're very good. But in order to earn a living and have a wife and children, and da, 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 you <laughs> he, he teaches in Arizona. Admittedly, in a school that has some other interesting people on faculty, but it's not exactly local. And his wife, who is from Cuba, would rather be in at least another part of the state than in Arizona, etc., etc., etc. So <laughs> here he's desperate. He's quite often to be seen on lecture platforms on the East Coast, and even occasionally in Europe. And he's very, very good. He's great. But he doesn't make any money out of it. He does these rather good buildings, but they don't pay any money. So he teaches. He's on faculty. I had to write citations so that he could get tenure about a year ago. And there he is. And I think this is a, you know, if somebody like as talented as this guy 
has to jump around with you know, throwing phone numbers at you in order to survive, then that is also intriguing. And that will be some of you. That will be some of you too. You will be working in one country, teaching in another country, married to somebody from a third country, talking about three languages, and still life is a struggle. You're still looking at your thing saying, God, it's Tuesday, it must be Venezuela. Uh, and I do that myself, and I'm over 70. You know. uh, and it's, it's, it, is, it is a predicament. On the other hand, do you do what the guy with the stuff is? You say, right, I'm in town X. It happens to sort of suit me. I get on a plane once every three months, maybe. That's all right. The office is in the same street as the school. I'm building. What the hell, anyway? It depends on the kind of conversations you want to have. Since I mentioned Enrique Marais, the, the late Enrique Marais, I have a uh, an odd photograph, because it's when he was still married to Carne Pinot, his first wife, before he died some years later. Um, because, partly because uh, Claudio was very influenced by Enrique, partly because what is amazing about Enrique, the late Enrique Marais, was how much he had done before he died at the age of 49. Uh, already, when he was 16, he joined the office of uh, Pinon and Diaplana. And already, when he was still in his early 20s, he and Carme had, had done this school, which was in Badalino, I think it's called, one of the suburbs of Barcelona, uh, with on a very low budget, full of ideas, not necessarily expensive ideas, but just immensely sophisticated attitude to things and stuff and space and so on. Still a reference point. Two interesting projects when he was still very young. One that he did actually do with, with his then wife. So it's their first really known published work, the series of Ruth. But interestingly, the project on the right, which the gossip around Barcelona is that although it takes the name of uh, Pignon and Via Plana, everybody knows that it was Mirais who did it. Now that raises further interesting issues. Do you go under the cloak of obviously an older and <laughs> work for somebody? And he worked for them while he was still a student. And do you bring their work up? I probably get sued if it's Pignon and Via Plana now I'm saying this in the A, but. Clearly, he was a much more brilliant designer than them, whatever your point of view. And suddenly, this stuff done in front of the railway station was really, really special. But it goes out of their office, of course. He was working for them and being paid. But there's all, all the question of how do you deal with that as an old architect with bright young people working for you, or as a young architect who wants to make your name standard issue is you get out from under. But sometimes you don't always have the money or the connections to get out from under. And there are more people I know who are sitting under, never getting out from under. And also there are a lot of people I know who are sitting over, not allowing the identification of the person under getting over, etc., etc., etc. You take my point. This issue of how you how you present yourself. And now the poor, the ashes of the guy lie in one of his most brilliant projects, which is the cemetery, which everybody knows. So he never really became an old architect. He was a fantastic architect, probably one of the most fantastic. But he never became an old architect. And he was an interesting architect right from the age of maybe 18. And we have a favorite figure in this institution, I'm sure, that always strikes me as a real star. I didn't, he also worked, and the link is that he also worked for Enrique Marais and also knows Claudio Wettstein. There are thousands of architects in the world, but some of the really good ones seem to know each other for, for reasons which would need another hour to discuss. 
Anandia Salonso, who I never seem to fail to introduce into lectures, may do the same pictures, is extraordinary and exuberant and does this amazing stuff that even the people who uh, agree with his sort of principles don't seem to have the talent to be able to do themselves. Uh, I think that he's a throwback. I just, these were taken at a dinner once in LA and show the guy in action. And, and I think, and, and his, his wife, who's as talented as he is, taking the photograph of maybe him, maybe somebody else, I don't know. Uh, and there he is, uh, as, as I think I've said in an earlier lecture, he is, I said to him once, you're real old school. He says, yes, I've got the same wife. I smoke a cigar. I'm old school. And, and it's true. He, he's, he's, a, he's an old school architect with a personality and doesn't care what he says and does stuff that looks like something, even though it's weird shit something. And I think that, <laughs> in a way, for, 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 for my temperament, that's, that's tremendously reassuring. He's not politically correct. He's not quiet. He doesn't do things by just one single principle. It's exuberant. Fulsome, he has a moustache, you know. Now he's about to become a dad. It's all sort of, it's very old fashioned. And what's intriguing, though, is if you dig around and look at various publications, you realize there's another Argentinian couple also working out of Los Angeles, uh, calling themselves Patton, who are sort of, you'd think they were the same, and they're younger. I mean, they're creeping up along behind. Hanan and, 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 and uh, Florencia. But actually, I don't think they're as interesting. They're a bit more circumspect. It's a bit more back into the architectural world as we know it. You know. But they probably will get more buildings done. This is the irony of the situation. There are agencies who make it their business to support young architects. This is a bookstore in Tokyo, that you can just see some funny stuff sticking out of the roof, and elsewhere, a bookshop that, has, that, that, that only sells architectural books and has a policy of doing little bits and pieces within the shop and on top of the shop. In other words, bits of the shop, they commission young architects to do bits and pieces of the shop, as well as selling their books and so on. Uh, would that there were more such agencies. And finally, therefore, since I'm in Japan, in the shop, I buy a little sort of cheap booklet about what's going on in Japan, and suddenly I see something I haven't seen before. Um, I suppose if you're very picky, you can say that it's a bit influenced by Preston Scott Cohen, but it's, it's not completely that. It's sort of weird. On. And you think, yes, yes, some young guys are doing something that's a bit unexpected. You know, it's naughty tubes meets corb and disappears into the forest. That'll do for me for <laughs> somebody's got some ideas going there. And then you turn to the back of the thing and say, who is it? And it's Hiroshi Nakamura. Well, half the people I know in Japan are called Hiroshi, and the other half are called Nakamura. <laughs> so, could be anybody. It's like saying it's by Joe Smith, the Englishman, you know, or something. Or, uh, you know, Tom Lee from Singapore. It's sort of, yes, it could be all of 15 people. So, I don't know who the guy is. And that's the point. That's the point. There's life out there. I don't know who this guy is. He was in a book in a funny shop but I'll keep my eye open for him, my ear, ear to the ground. Might be a very boring guy. I doubt it. Might be somebody I already know. I doubt it. Just because the name sounds a bit familiar. But the world goes on. And that's what it's about, being a young architect. Next week, how to be an old architect.